The Literary City with Ramji Chandran, exclusively on IndigoMusic.com. Hello again and welcome to the third episode of the Literary City podcast on IndigoMusic.com. My guest today is the incomparable Shobha Day. We will talk about life, love, feminism, and her book Insatiable, and weirdly, about having a bath in vinegar. All of us occasionally harbor contradictory feelings that end up generating guilt. Today, I don't want to think about the loss of two beloved friends, Double Valley. I don't want to connect the twin tragedies to myself, my own age, or the thought it was then yesterday, it could be me tomorrow. No, I want to dress up to the hilt and step out. I have a sleek black one-shoulder kaftan with pretty mirror work on the sides, meticulously demined by the lovely Lakshmi. I have carefully picked out a silver cuff, a beautiful arty cuff gifted by Raisa Hussain years ago. I bet she won't remember giving it to me. I shall wear the two new rings created by my daughter Arundhati's talented jeweler friend in Jaipur. So chic, ebony and gold with tourmaline. This is my official reason for not cancelling dinner and dressing up. I need a mood of a lifter, okay? Please don't ruin it all by exclaiming, how shallow. That mood will not be easy to manifest tonight, no matter what Big John adds to the cocktail. And even if the impossibly svelte Shilpa Shetty personally serves it to me, it's got to be something else, something I'm not able to process, because perhaps it's too painful. Given that our friend circle is rapidly shrinking, if they aren't dead, they have dementia, I don't recognize us any longer. The few we run into are tactless and crude. Age is the excuse for insulting others. I met such a bunch sitting around at the club, looking as sour as the limbu pani they were sipping. One of them said in an offhand manner, Let's see your face in strong daylight. Are, are, wait, I need to get my glasses on. Oh, you don't have too many wrinkles. Plastic surgery? These days it has become so common. Everybody gets a nose job, bum job, dick job. Nothing wrong in self-improvement. The rest cackled. The oldest of the lot bragged. Look at me. I have my own teeth, no bridges or dentures, my own knees too. The one in blue with lipstick on her teeth. Dentures were they? Chipped in. I though am a full original. No cataracts, no stents, no major surgeries, no hair transplants. Her friend interrupted. Didn't you have a hernia problem? Or was it piles? Some people are born 75. And that was my guest today, the incomparable Shobha Day. Shobha is one of the most famous writers in India, and her reputation has traveled everywhere. But it still behooves me to talk about the real politic of her literature. In other words, let me tell you why I think that Shobha Day is so significant to English language writing in India. Not only was her great success as an author inspiring, but to my mind, the most significant thing that I can say about her is that she kicked down the doors for generations of women writers who followed her. She gave women's writing a unique voice. At the risk of reduction, I'll venture that her novels explore the lives and the loves of Indian women who embrace their sensuality without apology. Even if simply living their lives is often a patriarchy-fostered challenge, her protagonists are never sad victims. They follow their dreams rather than fit into society's rules and expectations, and at the fount of their sentience, they will not be marginalized. I imagine that such a narrative is even possible only because Shobha's prose is honest. And it is very funny. But the likeness that she brings to the prose often belies the dark realities that she addresses. While most literature of the genre tends to be disconsolate, self pitying even, the humor that I speak of in Shoba's narratives are a testament to her skill as a writer. 
For this reason, I'm sure, her writing has been the subject of almost 100 academic dissertations of researchers and scholars in universities around the world studying feminist literature. And I imagine this number is still growing. Recently, Shobha launched her latest book. It's titled Insatiable, and it is a memoir, a life memoir, filled with anecdotes and personal experiences, told interestingly from the perspective of food. Artfully, Shoba crafts a narrative using food as the conduit for descriptions of events in her life that happened around it. In literature, eating and not eating are always symbolic, and food always means something other than food. Food is a fun metaphor in literature. Ernest Hemingway used it well, as did Shoba's personal favorites, Zelda and Scott Fitzgerald. And now, here she is, joining me from her home in Mumbai to talk about her life and literature. Shobha Dev, welcome to the Literary City. Privilege to have you here. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a privilege for me as well and a great honor. Thank you so very much. Let me begin by quoting the opening lines from your book, Selective Memory. Unfortunately for my mother, I was not the second son she'd prayed for. This sort of sets the tone for a lot of your writing, but you don't do what many writers do, express the same thing in sorrow and helplessness. That's not your jam, is it? It's not my jam at all. Nor do I look back in anger. Nice. And there are no real major regrets, and I'm not ever going to become that crotchety old biddy sitting there and saying, oh, life's given me such a raw day. <laughs> and uh, blame everyone, blame my mother, my children, blame my friends, anyone but myself. Uh -huh. That's really not my jam at all. One, you know, I'm kind of a practical Maharashtrian middle-class girl uh -huh. who takes what comes with the turf and I just get along with uh, life. Speaking of life, it's been 50 years? Literally non-stop for 50 years. Now, when I look back, it doesn't really seem like 50 years at all, which is a, a wonderful thing. I, it's, it's great because uh, it makes me believe I've got 50 more ahead of me, which of course is nonsense, but it's a good way to feel. <laughs> Wonderful. Back to you and women. Now, you would never quarantine your women in a zanana now, would you? Only because I would never ever want to be a part of that quarantine zanana community myself, have never been. And I think it's disrespectful to create such ghettos. And I would never do that. And there's no pattern to your protagonists. You never stereotype your women. But your men, they're pretty basic, aren't they? They have an <laughs> on-off switch at most. <laughs> well, yes and no. I don't think I feel uh, active hostility towards men. I think they're kind of okay in that place, if you know what I mean. But... <laughs> The attraction has always been to understand women. They have many more challenges to deal with. They're far more complex. Uh -huh. uh, they are not what they appear, even uh -huh. sometimes. After knowing them for 10 or 12 years or 20 years or 30 years, it's like uh, Dance of the Seven Whales. <laughs> uh, you keep thinking, oh, this is the last whale. I'm finally going to know this lady. <laughs> but it has never happened so far because I like that complexity. I like the mystique. I like the idea that I can't completely decode, deconstruct. Whereas with men, it takes approximately seven minutes. <laughs> it's quite easy to figure them out. I, submit. I don't mean it as a put down or being superior, nasty, none of it at all. It's, uh, they're lucky to be this simple. They're lucky that life uh, gives them that uh, privilege of just being born male. They don't have to do anything much, really, to prove uh, anything to their family, especially in our society, in a patriarchal setup, in an Indian family. It's enough to be born a male child, and everything else appears almost like a miracle on a platter field. True. What you do with your life subsequently, well, makes a man out of you or doesn't. Right. But scratch the surface, and most Indian boys remain boys. I agree, and most the pity. Now, your writing has quite frequently attracted the label of feminism. In your feminism, and I use this for want of a different label, to my reading of you, the feminism that you portray is not a wishlist feminism. Your protagonists are natural in the way that they exercise choice. 
they uh, they don't wait around for male approval. They reject it, in fact, don't they? The feminism, a lot of people have tried to uh, make me speak about it. And it's very difficult because it was never a construct. It was not something I was uh, determined to project in my book and that the women have to be female warriors who are uh, Jhansi Kirani, Joan of Arc, or any of that. Uh, they were, in a way, a reflection of who I am and who the kind of freedoms that I have always taken completely for granted and never really waited for any authority figure to sanction anything to me. I have just done what comes naturally to me and tried to do the best I can without waiting for validation from anybody. So perhaps it's a kind of sneaky, subversive feminism, but it's certainly not the the flag-weaving variety of feminism to make a statement. And the protagonists in my book have lived their lives on their own terms like they should and uh, they're entitled to. Like uh, 99% of the men on earth uh, live their lives without ever having to answer questions about their any of their decisions and choices. And it is for this reason that I believe that academia picked up on you in a very big way. When I researched you, I googled Dissertations, Shobade. Uh, dissertations for Shoba. Now that sounds like the title of an epic song, doesn't it? Dissertations for Shoba. Yeah, Beyonce <laughs> should sing it. She should sing everything. Okay. So anyway, I found pages of results. And uh, as I said before, over 100 dissertations is a huge number. I read four or five of them entirely and then synopsis of a few dozen others and I was struck by the number of references to sex and sexuality. Yes. Almost all the researchers uh, said the same thing and they, to my mind, the women, there were no male researchers that I read, they all used sex as the doorway to, uh, to you. Personally, I thought that you were using sex as one method of description, but um, how does this sit with you? Quite honestly, I have not read a single dissertation Yeah, because uh, academia does not per se interest me and their take on my work uh, has no real context or for me in what I do. I don't want to be influenced by it in any way. And it's too dense and maybe they're reading too much into things which were never intended. So what is the point? But I understand what you're asking me because I the sexuality. It, for a lot of uh, young professors who often approach me uh, uh, to uh, seek my active participation in the when they're presenting their dissertation, and I've declined almost all of the time because I really don't have the bandwidth to deal with those kind of uh, copious and rather tedious questions about sexuality. It's uh, as if they equate sexuality with feminism and that alone intrigues them. Exactly. As if a woman who is in charge of her sexual self or of sexual pleasure is in some way opening a door for them mm. uh, and uh, represents freedom from uh, some sort of uh, shackles which they don't subscribe to and which certainly no one should. But for me to write about it was not a self-conscious act to provoke comment or generate controversy. I just felt that writing about female pleasure was something I enjoyed doing very much. And uh, I enjoyed reading other writers. At that stage, mainly foreign writers, women, who were writing about sex in a very beautiful, tender and uh, poetic, lovely, sensuous, sexy way. And uh, in India, that was almost considered taboo yes. for a woman to express any kind of a view unless she was talking about being abused sexually. Mm. Then it was valid. Right. If she was uh, a victim on some level of uh, sexual oppression or some kind of rape within marriage, it was justified. Mm -hmm. But sex as just a pleasurable activity, it was considered completely um, out of bounds for women. And I, I did it in the most natural way because I wanted to write the way I wanted to write and on subjects that matters uh, that I wish to write on. And it, it didn't matter to me what others thought about. 
That's wonderful. But Shobha, I'm I'm going to persist a little with this researcher thing. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. I want to read this uh, excerpt as an example. I'm going to read this to you. It's titled Lesbianism, a Repost to Sexual Subalternity in Shobade's Novels. I don't you know what that means. <laughs> I'm struggling with it, if that's any consolation. Yeah. And here it is. In a heterosexual relation, the woman has to pay the price at her own cost since she has to destroy herself, her voice, intellect and personal development for a man's need. She is considered subaltern. On account of this, Shobade rejects compulsory heterosexuality and suggests woman-to-woman relation or lesbianism is better than a man-to-woman relationship. Oh dear. That's some analysis. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> I mean, uh, the book she's referring to is uh, like a much ahead of its time, uh, lesbian psychotic thriller kind of a book about a very complex relationship between uh, two women, one of whom is not uh, uh, a consenting partner. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what this researcher is trying to get at. Maybe she's looking for some kind of uh, way through for herself in whichever relationship she might be in. But... Most researchers and also at the time when I started writing, most media media people who were attempting to understand my work or talk about it uh, were very obsessive about the sex. And the sex, uh, some of it was explicit, some was not, some was suggested, uh, some was, some books, some novels didn't even contain any mm -hmm. uh, sex at all. Like second thoughts, there was a few other books. Yeah. But Despite that, if it wasn't there, I was asked, why is there no sex in these books? <laughs> if it was there, I was asked, how come there's so much of it or so little of it? Of course. Almost like there's a quota system <laughs> and that when they pick up a show by day novel, um, there has to be a certain fixed ratio of sex to all the other pages. And uh, I could visualize some of them sort of uh, looking greedily, hungrily, <laughs> for where they put uh, chance upon some sexual passage that would probably help them get it off. So That's funny. I, it, it, it amused me then, and um, now it's just something I don't particularly pay much attention. I fully understand. Now, we've talked about gender and feminism. I'd like to talk about you as a social commentator. Uh, much of what you've written about is based on middle-class values, uh, even about the rich and famous. Even if you are rich and famous of a certain vintage, you will lean on some traditional middle class values, won't you? Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, this is a class of society in Mumbai and in some of the other cities that I know quite well. The very rich and the very famous. But scratch the surface and you will find uh, a middle class, solidly middle class and reassuringly middle class uh, way of life which is sometimes camouflaged with a lot of frou-frou around it mm -hmm. uh, you may wear your designer clothes you may have your private jets you could have a yacht somewhere in the south of France but at the end of the day when you come home what you want to eat perhaps is kitchen with your fingers and uh, I think our essential middle classness has been a huge strength and it's a, a big, big unifying factor. So scratch the surface of a rich and famous person and there's a real person underneath. So they do what they do because they can <laughs> and that comes across too in yes. your writing. Oh, and that's that's good. That's really coming through because it's meant to, but not as a, a big uh, statement. Right. Uh, but having said that, when I started writing about the rich and famous in India with my very first novel, Social Night Evenings, it was the world I knew best and most writers their first books are very revelatory because they tend to cannibalize the lives of people they interact with their own family or the kind of segment of society they are a part of. And Mumbai at that time, uh, as it still is now, uh, uh, incredibly magnetic, electrifying and very sexy city. It's aggressive, pushes you to the edge, but well, most of the billionaires live within a five-mile radius of where I live. These are people now I'm seeing for the uh, second and now the third generation and observing the change in now in their kids and their grandkids. 
uh, it's a world I know intimately and well. So when I wrote about it, people thought I had made it all up because before social media, before the paps and everything else, this world was not accessible to anybody outside the charm circle. No one knew it existed. So it was very easy to say that in socialite evenings, uh, the reference to Manabar Hill was actually uh, just a name I was given giving to Beverly Hills and um, more or less cloning what, that's where the Jackie Collins thing came up, the comparison. Uh, merely putting Indian names to situations and locations uh, which had nothing to do with Mumbai. They could not believe that the glitz and the parties that I described so with such aching accuracy uh, actually were happening and taking place, but they were and they still are. And perhaps I underplayed some of it, but not a bit of it was exaggerated or untrue. Right. From a middle class point of view, that must have seemed fantastic. Do you subscribe to your description of being a self-contest school mom? Well, uh, definitely. But oh, when my children once shocked me, and I'm not that easy to shock, when they said, but mom, really for all your 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 posturing, you're just uh, any old Puritan mm-hmm. uh, with, uh, yeah, tight as school mom. So <laughs> stop it and just uh, just start owning who you actually are. And what you, what you write is something very different from the person that we live with. And they really threw my kind of double life at me. <laughs> and that was quite a whammy because uh, increasingly I find myself uh, judging so many things about their lives and uh, they, they, they put me in my place by saying, you know, go read some of your idea books. <laughs> go back and read your own books. That's funny. Well, from the perspective of being a mother, I suppose that there's a different judgment that you need to bring to the table. Yes. There's so much more that you need to protect. But speaking of those earlier books that your kids mentioned, how easy or difficult was it to be non-judgmental? It was most natural. I did not think about it. I did not think, am I doing something that's very challenging? Should I watch what I'm saying? Should I keep my own opinion out of this? It was like holding up a mirror and uh, writing about the reflection. And because I am a fairly observant person, that wasn't so hard to do. Right. So the characters almost came to be uh, all fully formed. Uh, All I had to do was put them down in words and uh, create stories around them. The stories were part fiction, part reality. So my job was really made very easy easy for me in that sense because there was just a lot of inspiration around. There still is. So let's go from researchers to reviewers. Do you take reviews of your book seriously? I take them as seriously as the person writing them. Wow, that's good. If I have respect for that person's point of view, I would definitely read and reread the review and uh, chuckle over a few things, maybe be a little bad about a few things, and then then move on. I don't stay with reviews. I'm not stuck on other people's opinions of me, either about my books or my life. So it's something that I give as much importance to as I think it warrants me. And that brings us to your latest book, Insatiable, wonderful title. It's about your life and it's told through food. Yes. It was a delightful read and I'd like to quote a passage from the book on page 76. It goes, Now that I can afford mangoes, they no longer appeal to me. I feel superior to the mango and not the other way around. The mango needs me. I don't need the mango. Such a strange and silly game between a fruit and a woman. (laughs) I just love that passage. (laughs) Please explain. Well, it's like it was the forbidden fruit, as it were, the most desired fruit when I was a young girl, because it was literally like uh, like, uh, pieces of gold were being shared with the family. And one slice of that mango would be cut up into four equal pieces to be shared with the kids and things like that. So the mango had a power over me, which uh, I, I used to crave it and lust after it and 
dream about, oh my God, the mango season is about to start kind of a thing. And uh, it just to make me feel a little powerless because I couldn't go out into the market and buy it and couldn't gorge on it. I couldn't eat a dozen mangoes at one go if I even wanted to. I didn't have the money to do it. So today when I look back at that period, then the mango suddenly looks uh, kind of, it, 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 it seems and appears devalued. In in my eyes, so it still continues to be the king of fruit and still a very desirable fruit. But my own attitude to to it has liberated me from that original uh, inferiority complex that the mango gave me. <laughs> if that explains it. More than more than I think it's a metaphor for so many things. Yes, yes. And considering that this book is like a memoir. Yes. Of, uh, of your life set in the analog of food, which is which is a very clever construct. I uh, think it's a delightful read with so many familiar references and incidents and anecdotes. And I must ask you about the incident involving Padma Lakshmi. Oh gosh! Uh, yeah. I, I, I'll do a spoiler here for our listeners. This yes. is uh, at the time that Shobha was in a sit-down dinner, and she was seated right next to Salman Rushdie. And his girlfriend of the time, Padma Lakshmi, the TV celebrity, wow. comes over and asks um, <laughs> yes, Shobha to move, but you refused. No, I absolutely refused to get up and maybe, because I just felt she was being unreasonable and petulant and uh, threatened for whatever reason. Oh, I can think of a reason. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, but you cannot hog the, uh, the chief guest, he's there to meet with the people who have been invited. Right. Uh, you have to have the generosity of spirit to share that person. Because at the end of the day, it was Padma who was going back to the room with him she, and living with him. So what are we talking about? So I'm glad I did for my own. Maybe uh, in earlier times, I would have promptly, you know, I would have got to my feet and say, oh, I'm so sorry, Padma, of course, please uh, go ahead and take my place. But I'm quite happy that I didn't do that. So, isn't it ironic that such an anecdote involving Padma Lakshmi should be in a book about food? Yes, given how she is wonderful at what she does and a terrific food writer and uh, extremely um, appealing uh, in every sense of the word. But it was really the trigger was uh, when I was writing about that, it was the day that uh, that shocking incident and the attack on Salman Rushdie had taken place. It was in all the papers and it had disturbed me to an extent that I still find it. When I saw a Vic- Victory City and him promoting the book with the one eye, you know, he's sightless in one eye today and uh, he can't use an arm. And despite it all, I mean, look at the man's courage, look at his talent, look at his energy and his uh, thirst uh, for life. Uh, there he is. And w- most people would give up under far less intimidating physical circumstances, but she goes ahead and writes this incredible book. Incredible. I mean, hats off, chapeau. And speaking of yeah. Rushdie, you are a Midnight's child, aren't you? 1948, same thing as 1947. I agree, yes, absolutely. I feel very much a part of the uh, that era because he was a Bombay boy and all these reference points are the reference points that I grew up with as, uh, as a girl in and around Beach Candy and the places he described it. So true, so much of overlap. Now, before we go, uh, yeah. in your reading, your last line was, some people are born 75. Yeah. If I was writing about you, what would I say? Some people stay 35. Why 35? I don't know, you pick. Why not 18? Okay. 18. 18? 18. 18. That sounds a little young. I like 18. Okay. Just a precocious. In Indian society, at 18, you're still not an adult. You're, uh, you're still looking at the world with wonder and this enormous curiosity about yourself, your body, your attraction uh, for, the, for the opposite sex, their attraction to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything is so fascinating and there's, it's refreshing, it's new. By 35, you more or less, you're, you're a little bit jaded, a little bit cynical. You're supposed to be in full bloom and you're supposed to be very fulfilled at that point. But fulfilled is boring and dull. <laughs> I prefer 18 because it suggests untold adventures and I prefer that. <laughs> How wonderful. What a lovely note. 
on which to end this interview. Such fun. Shobade. Thank you so much for being my guest on The Literary City. Thank you. I loved it too. And thank you for your fabulous questions and the amount of work that you've put into doing this interview. I really appreciate it because most people would ask me at the end of the interview, so madam, how do you preserve yourself? (laughs) And I had to trot out the same old (laughs) that I soaked myself in a tub full of vinegar, darlings, and that's how I look the way I look. (laughs) So, I'm glad you didn't ask me that. <laughs> but Shoba, thank you for the beauty tip. <laughs> don't splash it on your face, the one. Don't let it get into your eyes. Just soak in it and forget about it. And lie there the whole night, get marinated and wake up looking divine. I promise you have been listening to Shoba Day, a wonderful writer and a great conversationalist. You do know she was only joking about taking baths in vinegar. Don't try it at home or anywhere else. I am Ramji Chandran. And I will be back next week with a guest you must not miss, the celebrated British historian Simon Seabag Montefiore, whom I interviewed about his book, The Family History of the World. And I'll see you next Saturday on the always fun, always entertaining IndigoMusic.com.